right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from a, actually a humid San Diego, unusually. We're not you're normally humid, so we've, uh, we've got a little humidity going on here right now. But I'm joined also by Chris Tate, who is in Melbourne, Australia, and he is in the tail end of your winter, right? It's a very, very chilly morning here. It's about three degrees now, money, which makes in the low 30s, as you would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, exactly. So nice, nice and chilly down there. Um, and Chris is from the trading game, uh, you know, where he helps um, put money into your share trading pocket and make it stick, even if you only have 30 minutes a day available, which is quite something. And, and business is good, Chris? Business is actually very good despite all that's going on with COVID-19. Yeah, which leads us to what we're going to talk about today, which is agility and resilience, particularly in business. And so around about now, you know, there's a lot of people, obviously, who have had a really hard time during this uh, ongoing you know, pandemic. And it has meant that they have to be extremely agile and resilient. And sometimes it's hard for people to figure out how to do that because they get a little bit paralyzed by the situation they're in. So um, what advice would you give to people who maybe are struggling right now, but struggling to sort of even figure out how to take a next step? Yeah, I, I think probably as, as an overarching point, and this is an overarching mm -hmm. point to start with, is that all entrepreneurs, irrespective of what their field of endeavor, irrespective of what their business is, generally by and large have a profound self-belief. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we, would, we wouldn't do it otherwise. It, it's simply too hard. Yeah. Uh, being an entrepreneur is not easy. And it's not easy in any field. Being, being your own person in business is not a simple thing. And I think as an overarching thing, that people need to fall back on that self-belief. Now, I, I'm always one for process, but I'm always one for basic process. Mm -hmm. And so if you're an entrepreneur who is struggling, go back to the reasons as to why you're an entrepreneur. Right. If, you're, if your business, if your life has hit a hiccup because of COVID, and that, that's completely acceptable. Mm -hmm. Go back to the reasons why you are internally motivated to do the things you do. And I'm, I'm a great fan of actually writing things down. People think of all these wonderful things they're going to do and say and all the rest and all their aims and ambitions. But they don't really exist if they're only in your head. If you've written them down somewhere, you, you have a series of landmarks, you have a series of touchstones that you can look back on and you say, well, look, I'm struggling now and I'm struggling yeah. because of these reasons. These are the reasons I started to do this in the first place. These are the things I fall back on because all of business is process. So if you can fall back on your process, be it whatever the processes of the business are, and they should be in place, but it should also be what internal processes you have in place. What, what are the things that get you going? What are the things that help you through the day? And I, I actually find they're simple things. I do what I do because it grants me time. Mm -hmm. So whenever I do things like I run into a string of trading losses, I go back and go, well, why do I do this? It's really hard. I do it because it grants me time. And, and once I fall back on my process and my internal processes, and I understand why I'm internally motivated, you, you, get, you give yourself a little bit of a kick up the bum Mm -hmm. And you start rolling forward little bit by little bit. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's a really good point that you just um, that you made there. Is this idea of why do you do what you do? Go back and rediscover why do you do what you do? Because I think um, you know, obviously for entrepreneurs, but I think for people in general, sometimes uh, people don't spend enough time figuring out why they're doing what they're doing they're just doing it and as you say when you hit a wall or when you hit a big obstacle if you don't have that underlying motivation or understanding of why you're doing what you're doing then you can get stuck very quickly and that's true but i i also think there's a people run into trouble with their language mm -hmm. that the stories we tell ourselves form our narrative and in by extension they 
they dictate the way we think. So people use the wrong words. But when mm. they run into an obstacle, they say, I can't. Yeah. Now, what, what that means to me is that they're putting the responsibility for what is occurring out there, that it, it's something in the universe that is stopping them. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, there, there are probably in situations very valid reasons why people can't do things, but people are much better off defaulting back to, I won't. All right, yeah. why won't I? What, what, mm-hmm. what are the reasons why I won't do something? And, and we'll use, uh, there's an analogy between trading and sales in that uh, people, uh, people assume that traders are right all the time. No, we're mm-hmm. not. We're actually mm-hmm. wrong most of the time. But being wrong does not diminish our capacity to make money. Right. And in sales, most of the sales calls you make are probably busts, but that doesn't mm-hmm. matter because we, we fall back on that time-honoured principle of the 80-20 rule. So long as you continue to make the call, so long as you continue to walk forward, sooner or later, you hit the one, in our instance, you hit the trade that pays for the year, right. you hit the business opportunity that pays for the year. But it, it's getting over that I can't versus I won't. Mm-hmm. And once, once you say I won't, you understand it's an internal locus of control. It's not external. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting what you're saying there because I also think that it's this idea, as you say, when people kind of get stuck and, and they think, you know, I can't do anything. I mean, one of the things that I would say to people is, well, there's a solution. There is an absolutely solution. Now, maybe some of the solutions aren't the ones that you particularly like, but there are solutions. Mm. So to say that there's nothing that can be done is not true to begin with. Of course, there's things that can be done. It's then up to you to figure out, do you want to do them? Um, which is the best one you, you can do? And maybe sometimes you have to, you know, the solution, as I said, is something that you don't really want, but it's the only solution that you have right now. And that, That's true. And I think what happens too is that people get caught in the notion that when they run into a problem, when they run into a roadblock of any sort, mm-hmm. they assume that the solution to the roadblock is some grandiose event, yeah. that, that it's some magic big thing that will occur. And, and look, to be honest, I, I blame a lot of the motivational speakers for that because they, they present everything as grandiose, as bigger than life, as all sorts of things. But as we know in business, business is a grind. And it's often the little mm-hmm. 1% grinds that keep you going. But yeah. when, when you look at things like, oh, let's look at Airbnb. Airbnb for years for its founder was a grind. They ate cereal three times a day. And it was, it, it was not a name brand cereal. It was cereal from a dollar store. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they had ring binders full of credit cards they'd maxed out. There were plenty of opportunities to stop and give up the grind. But it, it Yes, the idea was a good big idea, but implementing the idea is a series of tiny little steps and you just have to keep grinding out the tiny little steps. And it, and it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter whether you're working on your business, yourself, your relationships. It, everything is a tiny step. They're not magic fixes mm-hmm. that just occur. And I think that's the, and I, you know, it's kind of like the flywheel concept, isn't it? I mean, you have to push that flywheel around and at the beginning you're pushing it and it's really hard and it's only going a, a small amount of forward and it's over time that it, it builds up momentum. But I think you're, you're, you're a hundred percent correct there. I do think that people always think of, I'm, I'm stuck in this situation. What's the big thing that's going to get me out of this? And when reality, it's put one foot in front of the other and literally take a step. What, what, what's the lottery winning idea? Well, it's not a lottery winning idea. It, it's simply getting out of bed. Yeah. It's then doing yes. something simple like making your bed. Mm-hmm. And so life is a series of very, very simple things. Uh, here in Melbourne, as, as with everywhere, uh, mental health is a big thing. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's an area we now talk about freely and openly as we should. But many of the mental health ex- experts I've spoken to, when they're dealing with people who are suffering 
profound depression, they say, do one thing and only one thing. And the one thing they get them to do is make their bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you can always look back and say, I've done something. I, I have done a thing. And that always harks back to me from my student days when I was in college digs, you change your, your sheets, get them washed, but then for the rest of the day, completely forget to make your bed, come home from being out at probably two or three in the morning and go, <laughs> oh God, I should have made my bed. Oh, forget yeah. it. I'm just going to wrap myself That's up in a blanket and just lay there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it's little things that make the difference. Uh, and yeah. it, it, and it's... it's it's really interesting you bring up that though, that subject of mental health. And I think this is, and I think it's a really good analogy for people to think of because I, I knew somebody once who had, uh, um, she had at one stage in her life had severe agoraphobia. Right? She couldn't, she didn't leave her house for something like mm. four or five years. I don't know, but something incredible. But the steps in recovery were exactly what you said. The first one was getting out of bed, right? You know, and, and yes. bed. the sec second was putting on clothes as if, she was going to go out. Now she didn't go out, but she put the clothes on as if she was going yeah. to go out. And then various, on, and then actually it, it went on actually to then have a, a career as an executive coach. So I mean, quite, you know, yes. everything worked out. But to your point, it was those, it was those simple, well, not simple. I mean, they're difficult in their own stage, but small yeah. steps towards the goal, not the grandiose leap. But the, the thing that that speaks to is routine and process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I find when I, I get fatigued at trading and, and all businesses are fatiguing sure. is that you fall back on the routine and the process. Okay. What, today is Tuesday. What do I do Tuesday morning? Okay. I do mm -hmm. these things. Let's grind them out. Okay. I've got those out of the way. Let, let's move on to the next part of the process. And I think that when, when people become involved in business, they think that it's, it's, it's going to be this, forever for, is constantly churning hamster wheel of excitement yeah yeah without without realizing that there's calls to make there's paperwork there's always paperwork mm -hmm. then there's more paperwork and then the staff which is a hell of an experience yeah uh, then there's regulation and it, it, it's sure. all it's all that hack rubbish mm -hmm. that does grind you down but it, it, everything speaks to routine and process and, and I think to the point uh, that you're making there is, is that, you know, there's an end goal and there's a part of it that, you know, really energizes you. There's a lot of things that, that contribute to that that probably don't energize you, but you've got to do them. There's, there is, a, you mentioned motivational speakers. There's one a guy called Larry Wingett. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, no. But um, he says, he goes, you know, when people say like, oh, I don't love my job or I don't, I'm not happy all the time. And he says, he goes, he goes, I hate 95% of my job. He goes, because 95% of my job is finding the speeches, to, you know, the places to give speeches. It's Thanks. traveling. It's getting there. He goes, he goes, this bit standing on stage, the 5% I love, and the 5% is worth the 95%. Yeah, and, and that, that's the payoff. And I think people don't, um, they don't understand the asymmetry of the payoff. Yes. That yes. They don't understand that, you've got to go through all the rubbish before you get to the payoff. Mm -hmm. And this is, it, I, I find this now when I, I speak to young people and I listen to them, they don't understand the asymmetry of the payoff. They want to be famous and successful for being famous and successful. Yeah, exactly. They don't actually understand that it, it takes time, effort, mm -hmm. grind, blood, sweat, tears, uh, and, and a fair amount of failure along the way because for their generation, they've just been inoculated with this notion that, well, what you do is you start a YouTube channel, you take 4,000 mm -hmm. photos of yourself in a day and you're famous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and they see the, and they, and, and cause it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, having a younger son and my friends as well, uh, you know, they'll say, Oh, look, look at this guy. He's got 10, 20 million followers on YouTube. Right. And, mm. and all he did was this. And then you go, yeah, but what about the 20 million other people who tried to do that and who didn't end yeah. up with 20 million followers? Yeah, and <laughs> they don't seem to understand the survivor bias issue that's involved. Yeah, exactly, the, exactly. The, the, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of broken bodies on the way to that person. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I think exactly. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, the point that we, we started off talking about here, though, I think is a really, really good and, and, and salient one for people is that if you are, if, if business is hard right now, or you are struggling, and maybe you know, the industry you're in isn't doing well, or whatever, it's, it's stick really really stick to the processes that got you to where you are today you know maybe you're going to have to be a little innovative maybe you're going to have to pivot a bit but the fundamentals if you keep doing the fundamentals eventually it'll pay off for you Mm. if people want an analogy or a metaphor Mm. i I would get them to think of themselves as a barnacle they're just stuck to the bottom of the boat and they're not going anywhere and it doesn't matter where the boat goes, what the weather is, what happens, the barnacle stays stuck. And if people can get used to that notion of just sticking, because I forget who it was, who said that 90% of success is simply turning up and you just continue to turn up. And sooner or later, if you continue to turn up, then something happens. Yeah. And what was that? I think it was, um, the, it was, I think it was maybe uh, Wayne Gretzky or somebody like that who said, yeah, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Right? Yeah. And that, that's the thing. If you don't swing, then that's not the same as swinging and missing. Yeah. Swinging and missing has an honor to it. If, if you want to put it yeah. that way, because you're in the game. Yeah. And, and, if, and you can, and not, you can make adjustments. Yeah. And if you're not in the game, you can't win. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So I think this is great. I think great advice for people here because we know it's tough out there and we know um, people are, are suffering and are in different situations, you know, depending, you know, everybody's situation is very personal to them. But the point being that if you do put one step and one foot in front of the other, take some steps forward, stick to your process, stick to the things that you know that work, um, be creative if you need to be or pivot if you need to be. But stick to the things that, that, that got you to where you are and your confidence, like hold on to your confidence because, you know, you, you were able to do it. You'll be able to get through this. And there's going to be winners, right, Chris? There's going to be winners coming out of this. There will, at, at the end of the day, the, the people who are still standing when it is over will be the ones who are successful. Mm-hmm. People just have to find a mechanism that grants them the resilience to still be standing at the end of the day because it is very much a last person standing sort of environment. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely is. So I think to, to your point is go find whatever it is that you need to fuel yourself with to be resilient. Like mentally, I mean, <laughs> I mean chemically you could do that too, but I, I don't recommend that route, but mentally find some, whatever it is mentally you need to fuel yourself with to, to stay resilient. Yes. Listen, Chris, this has been great. So all of Chris's information have been his contributor bio below this video, but please do, before we go, tell people a little bit more about yourself and the trading game. The the trading game exists purely and simply to turn out world-class traders. It's something we've been doing for two decades. We've produced people who've gone on to run their own hedge funds, people who've traveled the world trading. And that's our number one focus. And so if people want to drop in on me, they can find me at tradinggame.com.au. They can find me on uh, Twitter under my trading game handle. You can find me on LinkedIn under my own name. Excellent. Listen, this has been fascinating. And thank you so much for joining me today from the other side of the world. Uh, I could, I'd swap a little bit of your chilly temperature right now to get rid of this humidity. I'd, but, you know. I'd, sw- I'd swap our chilly weather for your humidity. <laughs> Well, I know, like I said, I mean, you, when you complain about the weather in San Diego, people just, people from other parts of the world just go, really? No, really? really? What do you want? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're one of those entitled whiny people because it's not exactly perfect today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, Chris, this has been great. Chris Tate, thank you very much. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview release soon. Thank you. Thank you.